Welcome to Building Bellingham. I'm your host, Leo Cohen. Season two is starting off a little different than season one. We're not in the studio and our conversations are live streamed onto the Building Bellingham Facebook page before they make their way here. We're a little rougher around the edges, but the core is the same. Honest conversations with local entrepreneurs, talking about challenges, failures, and the effort it takes to build a successful business. Join me as we dive into the story behind one of Bellingham's biggest brands. Mr. Bob Pritchett, uh, thank you for joining me today on the Building Bellingham podcast. We're starting season two, and you're the first episode. We're kicking off with you in our new format with the the live Zoom uh, Facebook stream. Um, So thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. And so you've been doing a lot of Zoom calls lately. And uh, tell me a little bit more about what's what's pre-COVID like for you. Um, what's now like for you? Is there much difference as far as uh, how you're holding meetings and, 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 and handling all that? Uh, a lot more time on the screen, like everybody, I imagine. Um, I miss the, the being with people in person, and some days I really crave a conference room and a whiteboard. <laughs> the, yes. Uh, the ability to kind of think visually on a, on a wall. But uh, our team's done a fantastic job of adapting to remote work, and it's it's gone really well. But I think we're you know, we're working off of a relational capital that we build in person, and I'm excited to uh, to get to spend time with people in person again, hopefully soon. Yeah, that's an interesting concept, relational capital, where, you know, a lot of people are getting hired nowadays without even necessarily meeting in person. But you've got all these people here locally that are working from home, probably mostly now, but were in the office with you before. And how important is that relational capital? And like, what, what does that mean for people that are watching uh, that might be entrepreneurs as well? Uh, I, you know, I think we're, we're working off this reservoir of, you know, of knowing people already. And it's certainly there's people who've been remote all along and we are hiring people remotely who we haven't yet met in person. And, uh, and it's going, it's going reasonably well, but it, there's just something about, you know, that those, uh, you know, marginal spaces, right. The time before the meeting starts or walking across campus or going to coffee with somebody where you have those more casual conversations. I mean, I'm sure my experience is like yours that the, the Zoom calls, they start on time and they end on time. And in some ways they're efficient and productive, but they don't have that uh, that margin around them that where you get to know people. Yeah, there's something to physically being in the same room or being in the same studio or whatever it may be. And yeah, I agree with you. There's a, It's an interesting concept of cutting out all these like five to 10 to 15 minute inefficiencies um, and I know you're, you're big on efficiencies. I think that's really important in, in how you've grown this business. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what does the word efficiency mean to you and how have you, uh, how has that mindset helped you scale so far? Well, um, you know, I don't know that efficiency actually is, is the thing that I'm the best at. Um, I'm, you know, I like some of those, those soft margins, right? Because I think that in the end, a lot of what is, leads to success is relationships, right? It's about the people you know, the people you trust, the the relationship you have about um, being able to do things together. Um, For me, you know, I'd like to think that we are efficient, but it's, it, it doesn't come out of a kind of a, you know, a time clock and, you know, performance management process. It's more about this. It's kind of a, an intrinsic motivation efficiency, right? When you want to make stuff happen, when you want to make new things come out in the world, when you have a vision for where the product or the business are going, you get this kind of, uh, you know, intrinsic drive efficiency, right? And so that's why, you know, I want to be efficient, but I don't really, I don't love the word efficient because often it means, you know, stopwatches and cost control. And, and that's not, I don't want to, I don't want to win by saving. I want to, you know, win by succeeding. Yeah. It's more of a, a glass half full versus half empty type of mindset. And yeah, you mentioned to me about vision. Uh, you've got a big vision. Um, and it all started, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this all started as kind of a side project for you 20, 28 years ago. Yeah. You're working at Microsoft. They, they're encouraging you to be creative. And you had a vision because you're, you're a man of faith and um, you had a vision to, was it to, to, to uh, cohabitate? you know, the world of tech with the world of faith or how did this, how did this all start? Um, 
back then? Um, well, really, it started by wanting to keep my software development skills up. Uh, so I'd love to give you a, a high concept version of the uh, the origin story. But really, you know, I'd been a software developer and I was working in program management where you work on user interface and feature set. And I missed writing code and I wanted to keep those skills up. So I had a friend and uh, we met at church. We both worked at Microsoft and we were looking for a hobby project. And I said, let's, you know, write a Bible software program for Windows. I'd written one in high school for Microsoft DOS from the, the dark ages of computing. And uh, it was really about, first it was about just kind of keeping our skills up and maybe just having a little, you know, hobby business. And from there it grew into something I saw as a, as a real business opportunity. And over time, also really just came to, to love working in that space, right? We, we really care about our customers. It's a lot of fun serving people we care about. Um, we're building tools to help people study the Bible or run their church. And um, even though it's a very niche business, uh, there's some good things about that. It's First of all, it's a huge niche, right? It's, you know, religion's a niche category, but it's a massive niche category. It's completely global. So we have customers all over the, the world and have, you know, met many of them in different countries. And it's also um, in some ways kind of protected from other companies, right? Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they're not, you know, excited to put out a press release about their support for one particular, you know, religious faith or tradition. And that in some ways is a kind of a competitive moat, right? It keeps larger tech companies out of your specialized skill area. That's really interesting because not only is it kind of just one area of the market, but it's also a, a protective bubble in a sense. And it's very interesting because, um, you know, you're essentially, you've created out of wanting to go back and kind of hone your skills again on writing code to creating this um, pretty much the ultimate connector for the world of Christianity, essentially, mm -hmm. in all different, you know, languages, probably different uh, sects, whatever it may be. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how, like, what was the original idea besides writing code? What was that original idea? What was the first like core principle you're saying? This is what this program, this is what this platform is going to do with uh, Lagos. Um, and then it kind of grew from there into uh, a, a quite large platform. Uh, ultimately, we're building time machines, right? And that's uh, that gets back to that efficiency thing, um, but in a, in a very productive, forward-looking way, right? What The reason I was intrigued by the Bible software thing originally in high school is because I went to Christian schools and I had Bible class and I had to do Bible homework where you have to look things up in the Bible and find the verse that has this word or talks about this topic. And the way you did that, there was essentially this massive printed index that's called a concordance. And the book is bigger than the Bible because it has the entire text of the Bible like 10 times over. So you can you know find every word. Well, that's a tedious, awkward book to use, right? It's like, you know, paging through a dictionary. And software makes that faster. You can type in the word and find all the places it appears. And, you know, ultimately everything we did in Bible software was about saving time, you know, consulting your paper bookshelf, making it faster to look things up. And then all the tools we're building now for churches to help them to, you know, manage their website and archive their sermons and email their congregation and, you know, track things about their members. All of that is really about saving people time from busy work. Right? And that's what it makes me excited about technology is where we, uh, in a weird way, I, I love technology, but I love technology for its ability to free people up from technology, right? Nobody wants to go into any business to fill in forms, right? Yeah. You know, we put things into the computer to make our lives easier, but so many times we use technology tools that, you know, make our lives harder, right? I have to fill in this form correctly, or I'm not allowed to press the submit button, or I get an error message or whatever. But that's not what technology is for. The technology is supposed to be making life easier so that we can do what really matters, which is spend time with people. And doing that for the church is really rewarding for us because, I mean, you think about the people who go into ministry, right? People say, I'm going to become a pastor. I'm going to take this generally low paid job where I, you know, counsel people and teach people and, you know, and love people. Well, those those people want to spend time with people, right? They don't want to spend time, you know, looking things up in indexes or filling in forms or keeping databases up to date. So if we can automate that stuff, um, we're really doing a great service. Yeah, no kidding. Well, so for, for someone like you that uh, is, it has created this tech platform um, to make, to free up everybody's time so they can spend more time with people, how do you, when you're so immersed in tech, 
how do you yourself stay out of that trap of getting too wrapped up in tech? I, I mean, sometimes when you're the one that's leading the charge, you get stuck in the middle of it, right? Sure. Uh, like a lot of engineering minded people, I like solving problems, right? I want to, you know, I want, I see a problem and I want to bring a solution to it. And that's a, a lot of business people and entrepreneurs are that way. And what I like to do with technology is, you know, I come at it from two angles. One is to hear about what people do and look for technology solutions that can, can solve those problems or make their life easier. And in some cases, because I just kind of geek out about how cool the technology is, sometimes I even go hunting for problems, right? I see a technology solution that's so amazing. I'm like, I want to go look for a problem that this technology solves. You know, the I've got a hammer, I'm going to go around and look for nails, right? Yeah. And the bad thing about that is if you start treating everything like a nail when it's not, but if you can, you know, find a hammer and go find nails that really need to be hammered, then, then that's a great benefit. And I, I kind of enjoy approaching that from both sides. So a lot of what I do um, is uh, is talking to people about what they're you know what they do and where their frustrations and problems are, and then I'm also at the same time out there collecting technology solutions. You know, observing other businesses, reading about what's going on, even reading academic literature, and looking for how we can kind of put the problem and the solution together. Yep. So how do you identify that? I mean. As, I mean, obviously, time and experience helps getting better at identifying. But say, day one, uh, Bob, and day and day now, Bob, uh, with with that difference in experience, how how did you go about identifying uh, problems or identifying nail or the nails because you have the hammer? How did you go about doing that then versus now? Uh, well, it starts by because oftentimes, and this is the truth for most entrepreneurs, right? You are your own customer in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't like having to look things up in a, you know, this big, massive paper book to, you know, find where things were in the Bible. So I wanted to just type it in the computer and have the computer tell me. So I wrote a solution to my own problem. And it turns out that's a problem that everybody who needs to look things up in the Bible has. And they're interested in paying for help to solve that problem. And then after I solve my problems, I start talking to those people who I'm serving and say, well, tell me about your day. And uh, I actually, have, over time, developed techniques for how you you kind of invent new features, right? So one of my favorites is to literally talk people through their week. We'll get a pastor and say, you know, can we just spend an hour with you or visit you at your office? And we say, you know, what do you do on Monday? And, you know, with a pastor, it's often sleep, right? Because they preached on Sunday and Monday's a day off, right? And say, okay, what do you do on Tuesday? We're like, well, on Tuesday, I come in and I, you know, I look at a list of our visitors and then I, you know, send some emails and then I start thinking about my sermon and I'm like, well, where do you get your ideas for your sermon? And, you know, do you, do you get it from the newspaper or from, you know, reading online or from what people, questions people ask you? And you just, you keep asking why, 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 right? And what are you doing? What are you doing? And then as you go through that process, um, I like to ask, well, you know, do you like that? Do you not like that? You know, what's the favorite thing you do each week? What's your least favorite thing you have to do every week? What thing do you have to do every day that's annoying? And as you start to dig into those problems, you find things where you say, oh, I can solve that problem with technology. And a lot of the really cool features in our product came from doing those conversations with all the different profiles of people, whether they're seminary students or professors or pastors. Like when we built tools for seminary students, um, you know, who are going, essentially going to graduate school in theology, I had a, a graduate of seminary bring me his entire class notes. He'd saved every paper and assignment he'd written during seminary, and he had them all in a big plastic file box. And he gave me his plastic file box, and I just, like, went through his two years of seminary looking at every assignment and paper he turned in to see where we could use technology to help him complete that assignment or write that paper better. And that's, you know, the ideas come out of that. So, I mean, you're just, you're talking about, first of all, you created the solution and then just did the work. I mean, that's, it's, I know it sounds so simple, but you're, you're, you're going the extra mile to get all of the, it's, it's a game of inches, right? You're, you're, you're getting, whether it's the piece of paper that you have to copy and scan in to go in the database, because you're creating this, this huge world to make people's lives easier. And, and how does it from, as this being part of your faith, right? This is part of the world of your faith, right? Mm -hmm. how, and, and then there are also being money involved and you're building a business. How how is this, you know, through all of this? How has your faith guided you in and, and how has you know as a person? How how have you stayed on the course as an entrepreneur and as a business owner? Because, I mean, I'm I'm nowhere near in the same world that, that you are as far as uh, the level of success. But there's there's a lot of silver bullets that steer us off course. How do you how do you stay true to your course? How do you just focus on focus on the big vision 
um, from day one to day now? Well, I, there's a lot of angles to that. I mean, for me, uh, my faith is just integrated into who I am, right? So the fact that I work in that space is interesting, but it, you know, if I, you know, if, if I ran, was the manager of a local McDonald's or something, I, I would still, my faith would still inform, you know, how I treated people, right? I, I still want to be kind. I still want to be honest. I want to act with integrity, right? So for me, that's just, it's just kind of integrated into who I am. Uh, and working in the faith thing, it, it's both rewarding and has its own special challenges, right? When you work in the space that's connected to your faith or something, you get the customers who are like, well, you should give it away, right? Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a bivocational pastor without a salary and you should give the Bible study tools away or it's wrong to sell Bible study tools. And I'm like, well, did you buy your laptop or, you know, did, you know, did Dell give it to you because you're a pastor? Well, of course I have to buy my laptop, right? Well, it's a tool you need to use to do your job and, and we need to get paid too. We have to pay the people who write the programs. And, you know, that's the downside is occasionally getting into those arguments about, you know, why are you selling in this business? Um, the upside is the accountability. And that's what I focus on about being in a business is uh, even more than let's say a nonprofit. And this is whether it's faith or not, right? The great thing about businesses is they have accountability built in. I have to deliver value in a free economy or you won't give me your money. Yep. And if I deliver value, you will happily give me the money because all voluntary financial transactions are a value creator, right? You're giving me $100 for the product because you value the product more than $100. And I value giving you a copy of it, you know, less than getting the $100. We just made wealth in the world, right? right. And that's a win-win. And I think of all business transactions that are anything that's not done under compulsion as a voluntary business transaction is a win-win that creates wealth in the world. So I feel great about doing that and doing it for people I care about where I can serve them well. That's great. And I think, you know, there's another element to it. Like, you know, you, certainly there's businesses with horrible practices or who are exploitive or anti-competitive or all those things. And, you know, but I, I wouldn't want to be that person running a, running a hamburger joint or a Bible software company. Right. Right. Understood. And I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting because what you're talking about is this exchange and you're building wealth, not for, not just for yourself, but you're creating a world for people that work at your company. You have about mm -hmm. 300 people that work at Faith Life here locally at the campus down um, in the Flatiron building and then right across the street as well. Uh, is it on commercial? Yeah, we have five buildings in downtown Bellingham. Five buildings. You just blew my mind. I thought there was two, but you hid some from me. <laughs> well, they're kind of connected there. But yes, the whole block of uh, between commercial and Bay and Prospect. Yeah. How, so how did you, originally you weren't in Bellingham, but you decided to make this transition with all, all of the campus up mm -hmm. here, or most of the campus at least, up to the Bellingham area. How did that happen? Why did that happen? I mean, I'm in real estate, so I'm curious about why did you select this location? Why was this prime? Why was this optimal? Um, tell me so, a little bit more about that. I think that that's one of those, uh, as so many things are, a, you know, a sequence of, of accidents and coincidences and family issues. You know, I, I'm from New Jersey. I grew up outside Philadelphia. I came out to the West Coast to work for Microsoft. I started the business here with a friend. My dad joined the business to run sales and marketing, and back, but he was still back in New Jersey. And after a year of having a New Jersey sales and marketing office and a Washington software development office, we wanted to be in one place. My dad didn't want to move to Kirkland. We were, you know, down near Seattle. And so we moved to Whidbey Island um, because my dad thought it was beautiful and I didn't care. <laughs> so we spent nine years in Oak Harbor. Uh, and, but after the company kept growing through that period, and Oak Harbor is a, it's a nice town, but it's a small town. It and it just became, it was difficult to recruit. It was difficult to hire. And after nine years, we, the business was, you know, we thought poised for even more growth. So Bellingham was kind of our compromise, right? It was not going back to Seattle's traffic and costs and everything else, but a little bigger town than, than Oak Harbor. And Bellingham's where we used to come to go to the mall or go to Costco. or uh, And so we were familiar with it and it, it made a nice kind of compromise, you know, the Goldilocks city, uh, big enough to have a university in Costco and small enough to not be Seattle. Wow, you know what's great is be I feel like a lot of the times that I ask questions like that, or someone asks me a question like that, the answer is so much more simple. People think that there's, there's so much triangulation or different analysis. And sometimes it's just as simple as three things. Oh, this is, it was a compromise with me and my dad. And it had a lot of the things I liked and we just moved and we did it. Mm -hmm. um, tell, tell me a little bit about the Flatiron building, because that is such a cool building. It's not your standard shape, 
uh, it's in a really unique location. Tell me a little bit, how did you come across that building and how did you end up there? Well, we were already on Commercial Street, uh, right across the parkade entrance, and we were growing and taking over more spaces on that street. And when CH Tomb Hill decided to move down to the waterfront a few years ago, that building became available and someone representing the building owners reached out to us and it was uh, buying, taking over that building would double our real estate at the time. And it was more than we could absorb, but we were able to uh, to work out a, a way to, to make that transaction work. And we kind of grew into it over time. So the, the first year or two we were in there, we had a whole floor that was just kind of blocked off and nobody used. We just, we didn't need it. Yeah. But uh, it was great to have that space to grow into. And it's, we like the old buildings and being in downtown. You know, we looked at, you know, kind of more office park type stuff or Cordata or Barclay. Mm -hmm. But to me, there's a, there's just something awesome about being downtown, right? You're, you're part of a community. You're not just, you know, warehousing people in a slick concrete tilt up building with a big, huge parking lot around it. Right. And uh, downtown Bellingham has been fantastic. You know, we, we know our business neighbors, we're in the coffee shops and the restaurants and, you know, you, it has a sense of community and it's just more interesting, right? Our employees are out all over downtown all day long when we're not in the pandemic. And yeah. uh, when we survey people, they they love it compared to the options. So we're really glad to be there. So you just, something that is really fascinating to me is culture. You have a, a pretty incredible culture. And I, I think it's been, it's, it always trickles down from the top. It always starts by the culture that you you have for yourself. And it starts to kind of, uh, grow from there to the people that you bring into your world. And you, you mentioned something about surveys and then noticing that you're, I mean, everybody's walking around. It's a great area. There's so many great restaurants there. Got Woods and Antler downstairs, Antler Bakery, Woods Coffee, you know, Bayou across the street. If you want to go shock yourself, you can go to the Spark Museum. Um, but it, 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 tell me more about your culture. How do you, how do you create this world? I, I walk by and I see bikes hanging up like Faith Life bikes. I see it just seems like a culture of fun and uh, of, of community. And it's not just about working hard, it's about also um, the recharge side of it. Tell me a little bit more about how you created that culture. What, is that, what does it stand for? Um, the, you know, the culture is just where we wanna be, right? I mean, I think at the heart of it is, I want the company to be where I wanna work, right? And do I wanna work in a place with petty bureaucracy and a ton of ridiculous rules for no point? No, do I wanna be in a place with a bunch of forms no. Do I want to be trusted to make good decisions without having to, you know, have everything checked off and approved by five different signatures? No. So if I want that for myself, why wouldn't anybody want that, right? Every employee in the company would want to work in that place. And if I had to be in a company that had, you know, lots of process and procedure and rules and everything else, I mean, do I want to work with the people who would need all of that? No. I want to work with people I trust who are you know, interested in serving the customers and growing the company and, you know, acting with integrity. And, you know, so let's just hire those people and treat them the way we'd want to be treated. And occasionally there's people it doesn't fit or it doesn't work out for, and they don't fit in our organization. But we spend so much of our time at work, right? 40 hours a week and maybe even thinking about it when you're not at work. And, it, you know, it's a huge number of your waking hours are spent at work. So why shouldn't it be enjoyable and, you know, a pleasant place to be. It's where people, you know, build friendship networks and relationships or even find their spouses, right? We, you know, I can't keep track of the number of people <laughs> married somebody they met were working at Faith Life. And you, um, do you, wait, do you have a, uh, do you have a church in Faith Life that people get, can get married at within the company? <laughs> no, we don't, we don't have that. Um, but, you know, I don't think of the business as something we're building to some end goal, right? It's it's something we just, we participate in every day, right? So, I mean, it's like the whole classic journey is the reward thing, right? Like we're not going to some destination. I mean, the, the destination is every day showing up and being part of the process. So we're just trying to make a place where that's enjoyable and productive. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I already, like, and again, I'm a, I'm a younger business owner, a younger entrepreneur, where there's... There's five of us here on our on our team, but so culture is really important to us. And it, and for me, it and, and again, maybe it's just time in business and, and experience. But I mean, five is already it's we're already we have this like melting pot of people, and there's five of us. And I'm thinking, wow, there's 300 and 302 people that work at Faith Life, including yourself. How do you 
keep like on that graph of quality and quantity, like how do you grow your business and scale while also like really keeping an eye on culture? Is that like how, why you keep, why you do the surveys and, and really check in with people to make sure that that is continuing to be the, the trend at the company? Yeah, I mean, and the culture is always changing, right? The culture is made up of the people in the company and you certainly give it an imprint and people would generally adapt to what they join or, or reject the culture. Um, but it does change, right? It's not exactly the same culture it was when we started. Uh, and I can think of multiple kind of different eras of the culture in my mind. And, you know, it, it is very different than it was in the, you know, let's say that late 90s or something like that, because it reflects all the people who joined. And so we're just trying to balance that out of, you know, you want the diversity of ideas and opinions and, you know, personal styles to come into the organization, but you got to um, protect what's really core, right? So for us, it's a it's a set of values. We have seven values that have an, an acronym, HOGIES, and those values are like, they're the, the untouchable thing at the center of it. And if you're not comfortable with those values, you're going to not fit well at Faith Life. But if you are, there's room for a lot of, you know, specifics to be, you know, to change and grow within that value core. But having values that everybody can articulate, I think really helps. And so did you create that or was it a, a combination of the management team or was it everybody that contributed to Hoagies? I think about sandwiches because um, I love Hoagies, but it's clearly an acronym for the core values. Tell me who, who, who contributed to the original core value and how did that, how did that progress? So I think that, uh, I mean, I wrote the Hoagies document, right? So I came up with the list of values, and did it, but it was, you know, 15 years into the business. And so it reflected a lot of kind of who we'd become. And in some ways it's aspirational, right? So our values are honesty, openness, awesomeness, growth, initiative, elegance, and shipping, right? And then we have kind of commentary and slides on each of those to explain what that means to us. And then we even have stories that back that up or are examples of what it means to live out that value. Um, but there, I think you could ask almost any Faith Life employee and they could recite them back to you, right? And we celebrate them, we talk about them, we, you know, we give people examples of what it means to live them out. And that, that gives everybody this kind of center core to come from. And they are my values in the sense that they're what I want for the company and what I wrote up as a founder, but they're also, you know, they're our values, right? I mean, I wrote them well into the life of the business with, a, you know, an understanding of who we'd become. So how, how important, I mean, you, you started the first 15 years. It's not that you didn't have core values, but you just hadn't put a finger on them and, and, and basically written up a constitution that was the core of who you are. How, so tell me a little bit about how does that help you make decisions? I mean, it's part, you know, you said as a person, uh, faith helps you make decisions. It's part, it's your guide of how you make decisions and how you treat people. And then within another, another realm of your world in the business and other people that work for you um, at work at Faith Life, they operate off this hoagie. So like, how does this inform decisions? How, what's, what was the intention to help people inform, uh, be informed to make decisions essentially? Um, it helps you make decisions. It helps you decide what to do and what not to do. And there's more devices too. We have a, we have a PowerPoint presentation that, you know, has the values and then also as we call the faith life way, right. Where we get into some even more detailed specifics. We've had corporate values before, but nobody could remember what they were. They were just kind of some, you know, very vague, highfalutin, you know, high concept thing that nobody paid attention to, right. These values are more specific. Like I said, they were backed up with specific examples in the, uh, and this faith life way of doing things. And the way it informs how we work is uh, the values are intention, but you can you can appeal to the value to make an argument, right? We should do this, you know, or we should not ship this this week until we add this feature or do this thing because it's not yet elegant, right? And elegance is one of our values. So I'm gonna raise my hand and say, don't ship that because it's kind of awkward and it's not elegant. And someone else can say, yeah, but shipping is actually one of our values, getting stuff out the door and moving ahead. Well, shipping and elegance are always intention, right? And that intention is kind of intentional, right? And, uh, but we have that, the conversation within that framework, right? It, one of those doesn't outrule the other. And some of them are a little redundant. Honesty and openness can have some overlap, right? right. But those, those things do tell us, um, you know, what to do, right? You know, Honesty is one a lot of companies have, but for us, it 
you know, when you make it one of your values, it's not like there's companies out there that say dishonesty is one of our corporate values, right? But there's certain businesses- Practice it, they don't actually say that they're dishonest. Yes. But you know, it's very rare for them to say it. It's one of their values, yeah. right? But for us to say it means that sometimes, you know, sometimes it means taking a hit, right? You know, we have to confess our mistake to the customers or we just go on the blog and say, hey, we screwed up and here's exactly how we screwed up and here's what we're going to do about it, right? Yeah. And the same thing on openness, right? You know, we don't, we don't have, um, you know, if you work at Faith Life, you have access to, the, there's not a lot of confidential information, right? Is there things I don't want to tell everybody in the outside world or tell our customers right now? Maybe, but in general, we just, we default to openness and, you know, we, we don't have 500 levels of permissions inside the company. We have the basic controls you need for legal and, you know, financial reasons, but, you know, in general, people know what's happening in the company. They have access to the files, the documents, the, you know, because that lives out our openness value. Right. Well, and you were talking earlier about expectations with, with, with people in your world and, and really focusing on what you can control is essentially the, the concept, right? And so you're talking about this, I really love this concept of openness because that's something that we also practice with, with our customers and clients. And it's, uh, I meant, here's what I own. Here's what happened wrong. Here's what we're gonna do to make it right. How, how did you, I mean, is that just something that, that you, as an entrepreneur, is that something that you, it was just, it was, you know, innate, it was just there. Or did you develop that over time saying, you know what, as you, as you grew as a person, you started thinking, you know what, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm just going to own that I'm going to make mistakes and we're going to make mistakes. And there's, as we get bigger and bigger, the mistakes get bigger and bigger, or they become more, more often. And that's just natural. How do you, how do you own that? Or how do you teach your team to, to own, own their mistakes and, uh, and, and take the best step forward? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and we do have to train people on that because uh, like a common uh, problem we have is people join the company and they bring assumptions or values they learned at other companies, uh, right? They, they come in and they believe that what, you know, it, that they have to protect the company from the customer, for example, that's a classic one, right? The customer calls up and, and is screaming mad that, you know, you did something terrible and maybe the customer misunderstands it, which is often the case, right? Well, you can either say, no, you're completely wrong and we were in the right and here's why you were wrong. Or you could be like, I'm really sorry. And that that happened and what can we do to make it right for you? And we do actually have to train people. Some people come in and they're like, well, my last company, you know, we, we, we put up the defenses or, you know, our attorneys told us to never apologize because then we were admitting liability or what. And we're like, you know, we're not running a hospital. We're not, you know, doing surgery on people and making medical malpractice mistakes. We're, yeah. we're selling software, right? It doesn't have even a physical form, right? We can admit our mistakes. We can apologize. Um, and we actually have to train people that we have a class. When you join, we talk about our customer service philosophy and we, we have to remind people that it's okay to say, we're sorry. It's okay to admit that we got it wrong. If we, double charged your credit card or we, you know, didn't ship the thing in the time we said we would or whatever it is, we can, we can own up to it and apologize. And because we're, that's part of our value. We're being honest, we're being open. We want to be awesome and how we handle that for you. Um, and it comes out in other ways too. Like, uh, you know, I had a recent episode where somebody who worked at another company, you know, we, they, they perceived that a competitor had done, some, done something wrong and they, they actually asked me for the contact data on our attorneys so we could get an attorney letter sent. And I was like, why would we send a letter from our attorneys? They're like, well, this other company did this terrible thing and we need to tell them to stop. I'm like, have you called them yet? And said, would you please stop? And they're like, well, no, we, because the last company I worked at, we, we sent attorneys letters. I'm like, we don't send attorneys letters for anything. Just call them up. And it turned out it was a misunderstanding. And the other people on the other end were super nice and friendly and happy to take care of the issue and take the thing off the website that was a problem. And it, but it, it was like a retraining episode, right? You know, yeah, stop, come, stop doing passive aggressive sticky notes, you know, just, just go <laughs> talk to somebody, right? Right. So, and you're talking about there's, there's this triangle that's the, it's the quality price and service, right? And it's, it's, it's kind of a core philosophy that I've understood uh, about you mm -hmm. that everybody lands somewhere in that world, right? Right. And you have this target of where you want to land, but you can't have all three, right? Is that, a, is that a myth to be able to have all three and do it really? Yes, I used to think that you could, and somebody set me straight on that and explained how you can't. And uh, so we chose to focus on uh, service. And if we, you can, you can kind of have two, you can live on one side of that triangle and we live on the quality and service side. And 
pretty much ignore the price corner of the triangle. Um, but if we had to pick one one corner, it's more towards the service side. Yeah. So how, and how do you how do you come to peace with that? Because you're running a business and you have to think, well, the quality takes time up front in kind of the beginning stages and the service on the other side takes time on the like on the on the, the you know customer service side. So how do you how do you just as an entrepreneur or as a business owner, how do you just make peace with well, it's going to sell if we do the right thing on these two sides. It's almost just like having faith in in the ability for those two things to come back to you uh, tenfold in a in a bigger in a bigger way. How do you how do you make peace with that? How do you think about that? For me, it's just having a broad perspective, right? I read up a lot about other businesses. I you know I try to not just know my business, but to know a lot about other people's businesses. And you, you survey the whole world, and you realize that in every category, there's somebody competing in each of those corners, right? There's in fact, it, it's almost like every market evolves into having a quality leader and a service leader and a price leader. And it, so part of it's just a choice. And I don't think it's like a right or wrong thing. We are in the service corner and I have, I could give you a bunch of good reasons we chose that corner, but I have a competitor who's in the price corner and they're also successful in a different way. And I think there's, you know, if you, you name a business, whether it's cars or hotels or retail stores or whatever, we can... We can all think of who's in the quality price or service corner. And they're often successful businesses in each of those places. So I, I don't think of them as a right or wrong judgment or a good or a bad business decision. It's a, it's a choice of where you want to be or even where the market opportunity is, right? If I was going to enter a completely new category here in Bellingham, I would look around to see who was in those different corners in my category and see which corner was, you know, had the most opportunity. Yeah. So, and you're talking about value. I mean, how do you determine your value? I mean, it's, it's such a difficult thing when there's not like comparable businesses kind of essentially to give you kind of a frame of reference of what am I supposed to charge? How do you, how did you decide, like you've got quality and service as your focus, but then you, you have to pick a price at some point, right? You have to say, okay, let's just go to market at this point. How did you, how did you decide on that from the, from the CD-ROM day, right? To, to the, the day where you can download an app or, or, or update your, your, your software, whatever it may be. How did you determine that? Has that changed over time? Has value grown as you've grown? Um, you know, it's, sometimes it's just an instinct. Uh, oftentimes there are competitors who help inform that, right? You can look at the market and see what people are already paying. Um, although often the innovative solution is to dramatically change that either higher or lower, right? That can often be the way is to kind of push the, the edges of the triangle out into one of those directions. Uh, you know, we have competitors in everything we do. We, there's no area where we don't. And so you can benchmark against the competition. Um, you can also charge about the value you're delivering. Um, but you have to weigh that against lots of stuff, right? Just how much money your customers have, how many customers you want to have, right? I love the joke about, you know, it's like if you can make a newsletter for billionaires and charge a million dollars for a subscription, you know, there aren't a lot of customers, but you only need one, right? Right, yeah. Um, and it, but at the other end, you know, you, if you make a newsletter that costs a dollar, you're going to need a lot of customers. And it's about, you know, how much does it cost to acquire and find those and what's the size of the market? So those are always the things you're, you're trading off. I think it's really, for me, it's fun and interesting to experiment with going dramatically different on any of those things. And I think so many people, I mean, pricing is, is under thought about. Most businesses just look at their competitors and price where the market, you know, that in, in that market, instead of saying, what would happen if I went the other way, right? And I love all those stories about, you know, like the restaurant, the New York steakhouse that has the hundred dollar cheesesteak, right? Well, that's yeah. not what all the other cheesesteaks cost. That's 10 times as much or 20 times as much, right? And then there's the, you know, people go the other way and say, how can I give this away for free, but make it up in some other part of the business? And right. I, I mean, that would be my challenge to anybody listening. And whatever business you're in, you know, do a thought experiment. What if my price was one tenth what all my competitors were? What would be different about my business? And what if it was 10 times what all my competitors were? What if I took the thing I'm selling and had a version of it that cost 10 times as much? Who yeah. would buy it? For what reason? How do I, how do I get, how do I contact them? How do I, I get this to them? Yeah. Sometimes just doing it is the answer to that, right? The guy with a hundred dollar cheesesteak got all the free press in the world because who in the world could charge a hundred dollars for cheesesteak and how amazing must it be in what way to be a hundred dollar cheesesteak? And boom, he's everywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, something interesting that I've, I've been thinking a lot about, I've spent a lot of, I, I'm, I'm lucky to have a, a, you know, an awesome team around me and you, you clearly have an amazing team around you. 
um, from, from all the way at the bottom, all the way up to the top, all of the people involved, right? And, but so much of our time is spent alone, right? As an entrepreneur, you're like, you're especially coming, diving into a, a niche market where, you, you know, you're, you're at, you're at Microsoft and you're, and you're creating this, you're just, you know, starting out with wanting to get back into coding, but you create this business. And I, I bet a lot of the time it, like you probably had people you could bounce ideas off of and, and, and mentors and, and colleagues and whatever it may be. But how did, how do you as an entrepreneur, like, what's your sounding board? Where do you, where do you go? Uh, maybe it's faith, maybe it's friends, maybe it's other business owners in town. Where, where do you go to have a sounding board to say, Hey, I've got this really out there idea. I really like it. I think it's going to work, which is the classic entrepreneur statement. I have a really good idea. I think it's going to work. How do you, what's your sounding board? Oh, I use everything, right? So um, I, I've got friends, I'm in business networks where I, you know, network, spend time with other CEOs or business leaders in non-competitive businesses. Uh, I talk to my competitors whenever I can. I talk to family members. I talk to employees and team members. I'm probably kind of annoying in how much I want to like run my latest idea by whoever happens to be standing near. Um, and part of it is that ability to, to, you know, when you try to sell something to somebody, sometimes even just the process of explaining it to somebody makes you think of new things. The other sounding board for me is history, right? I mean, so much of business is pattern matching, right? And I think of reading business biography and history and all those things as building up this toolbox of patterns I have to match against. And I'm very often kind of in my head running my idea against, you know, somebody who's been dead for a century, but I read a book about them and it made me think about, you know, why they made that decision and how, right? I recently read the new uh, Edmund Morris biography of Thomas Edison, right? It's like for the next, you know, month, I was running all my new ideas against Thomas Edison's business plans, right? He, he was my sounding board and he's not around. Um, and that's just the, uh, you know, looking for as many patterns as you can put in your toolbox and then running as many matchings as you can against them. So on the flip side, I mean, you have all these resources, all these people in your world that, you know, you past, present and, uh, you know, of many different walks of life, but how, how do you, how do you determine and filter what's worthwhile? Is it just experience of like, wow, I, tr I tried listening to that before and I was like, Oh, that didn't work. That was not a good, good person to listen. To. How do you, what are some things that you just pick up on where you're like, Oh, I should probably listen to this person. Or is it just my t I just listen to everybody. I mean, wh what does that look like? Uh, my favorite thing that is a little, um, less than obvious is I love to listen to failure stories. Mm -hmm. I like to read about failure stories. I like to hear failure stories. I love to know what didn't work. Um, because success stories are terrible teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Success stories tell you what worked for one person in one time in one circumstance that probably will not work for you, right? You, you just can't learn anything. You can't learn much at all that's useful from a success story. You learn from a failure story. So even like reading the Thomas Edison biography, the advantage of reading a Thomas Edison biography is it's not the highlights of inventing the light bulb, right? right. It's actually all the failures and his incredibly disastrous mining venture that he just poured tons of money into. And you never hear about that. You hear about the phonograph and you hear about the light bulb, but you never hear about the fact that Edison like literally burned up an entire fortune in a completely ill-fated mining venture that was never going <laughs> to succeed. Right. But where you really learn from Thomas Edison is when you read a lot about his his terrible mining venture. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the great teacher is the failure, because then you can say, oh, boy, the way he just never gave up on that stupid idea is a lot like how I'm never giving up on this thing that I should probably stop throwing good money after bad on. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sure, we've all heard the like he just kept trying to find the filament for the light bulb. And that was wonderful. And that's a great story about per persistence. But that same persistent nature led him to burn up a fortune in mining. And I think that uh, this leads to another thing, which is um, we we've, we've are certainly celebrating the entrepreneur in America, but, and we say things like, you know, they're risk takers and people who do bold things. And I don't think it's that way at all. I think the entrepreneurs are, you know, at some level delusional people who have an, a vision of the future that's different than everybody else's. And most of them are wrong and fail, and we never hear about them. And a few of them almost by accident happen to be right or succeed for, you know, despite themselves and we celebrate them and then look for patterns in what they did. I mean, there, there aren't that many useful patterns in what they did. It's it'd right. be more interesting to look at the, the 99% of them that, that failed and went out of business and find out what they were doing. 
Right. Well, and, and you here, so you've clearly cr created a level of success. You've grown this world and you've allowed, you've allowed others to grow within your world too. And what was your, what was, what, what money did you burn on the mine, the mining, you know, investment and you're like for, from, for metaphor's sake, what was, what was one of your, like, what's one of your failures that you've learned the most from and, and probably could really, uh, you know, speak to a lot of people that listen to this? Oh man, the list is so long. Um, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> you know, we tried to turn our software platform into a kind of a universal digital research thing. And it would have been a huge and really amazing business if we succeeded. And we were looked at taking the technology we built for Bible study software and going into legal and medical and all kinds of other forms of reference. But we didn't have the customer base. We didn't have the capital. We, you know, I, I still think the idea was sound, but we just didn't bring any of the right tools to it that you'd need to. Plus the fact that there's some, you know, other random elements of that. So we spent a ton of time and effort making our software really a generic digital library solution when we only had one customer base we were serving and we should have spent more time focusing on their specific exact needs or gone and get gotten the capital and the resources and everything we would have needed to take that run at the bigger market. But instead we tried to run at the bigger market while being under resourced. Um, so that was a huge, you know, wasteful disaster that, that sucked up a lot of resources and energy and distraction. Uh, and we have a number of, you know, kind of failed product launches like that, or kind of half-hearted websites that are still limping along, but never really got the customer traction because we didn't have enough attention. I think for me, one of the problems is I like starting things and we start way more than we can really put all the energy into supporting. Uh, <laughs> some good things come out of that. Like out of that, sometimes, you know, something you didn't expect turns into a big success and, and goes, goes strong. But uh, so I'm, I don't, I want to stop doing that completely, but I think that we could do a better job of, of choosing what to, to invest heavily in and then putting the right investment into it. Interesting. And so in those moments where you as an entrepreneur, you're, you're on this brink of diving into something big um, from a capital perspective, I know a lot of people that are running their own businesses or entrepreneurs here locally um, have, there's many different stories of how to get to, you know, wherever they are. There's raising capital, there's uh, just grinding it out and just, you know, pinching pennies from day one to day now. What, what was that like for you? How did you, how did you grow that machine um, from a capital perspective? How did you raise money? How did you, how did you end up starting this, this up? Was it all personal investment? How did that happen? It was personal investment until we shipped the first version of the product. So we didn't quit our day jobs until we had a product in the market and orders coming in. And then we raised in 1992, $120,000 from six people. And that was our angel fund that let us quit our day jobs and go full time. So I'm kind of in the middle. Like I actually am a huge fan of bootstrapping and a lot of people are like, well, all I need to get my business off the ground is some money. I must always tell those people that the money won't help you, right? But I did take money. I just took money. It, what I think of is the sweet spot, right? After the product was in the market and I proved the concept was right, then I brought the money in to accelerate the growth. And my favorite thing I've ever heard about money in business is money is an accelerant. Money does not make you successful or cause you to grow. Money speeds you up. And it's like, which way is the rocket pointed? If the rocket is pointed up, and moving up and you add money, the rocket will go up faster. If the rocket is, has already turned and the rocket is aiming to the ground, money will drive you into the ground faster, right? The money is just gonna take whatever direction you're going and accelerate that. And a lot of people, they haven't really got the rocket pointing up yet. It's, you know, it's still laying flat on the ground and, and they're just gonna, money will just cause it to slide along the ground. Um, you've gotta make sure the rocket is already on its way up before you add the money to it. Um, and I look back over the history of the business and I think there are days when, you know, we didn't put much money in for a very long time. And I think I probably should have put money in sooner at certain points, but I'm really glad I didn't put more money in at other places. Because if you don't, if you're not aimed the right direction and already going the right way, it, it'll actually make things worse. So on that, on that metaphor of rockets, when you have an idea or someone from your team has an idea, how much time, what's the sweet spot? I mean, it's probably dynamic. It's different from project to project, but how, what's the sweet spot between thinking and doing? What's, is it like some people just do and they fire it off and it shoots into the ground. Other people sit there and they position it at the right star and they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. What's, when's the moment, that, what's your tipping point? Uh, 
I think that I, I'm a huge fan of rapid decision making and lots of decisions, right? I would rather make constant moves. You know, there are many ideas that I act on within 12 hours of the idea, right? We'll go to lunch and we'll come up with a great idea and I won't go to sleep before I've actually taken concrete steps to making that idea happen. And a lot of that stuff doesn't live past a week, right? And maybe with more thought, you wouldn't have even done it. But I like, I just get right into it. And some of those ideas, you get right into it and they turn out to be great and you just go ahead and, and push forward with it. So I think that people, when I talk to people who've got business ideas that they're waiting for capital or resources or whatever, they're over, I think most of them are overthinking it, right? They're waiting for some kind of gating factor. Well, I have this great idea, but if only I had the right funder, the right amount of capital, the right mentor, the right you know marketing partner, then I could move ahead on it. Those things aren't really your getting factor. Your getting factor is just starting it. Now, yes, maybe to really be successful, it will need some of those other things, but you can get started on proving whether it's right or wrong, and then that makes those other things easier, right? I mean, I, I talked to somebody who, you know, they wanted to, to make a product and sell it, and their dream was to have a store and where they sold this product. And I was like, well, are you making that product and selling it at the farmer's market now, or are you selling it at, you know, where are you selling it on the web right now? Well, like, well, no, I'm waiting until I have the money to open my store and then I'll make this product and sell it in my store. And like, well, you're, you're just turning that into an excuse, right? You could find out if that product sells. And in fact, if you do the hard work of selling it at the farmer's market or selling it online for, for six months and building up a customer base and proving that it sells, it'll be easier to get somebody to give you the money to open the store. And even if your whole vision is you want to make that product in your little studio in this little store, the, the path to that starts with starting. And I think most of the people I talk to who haven't yet realized their business dream, they're, they're letting some external factor be the gating thing. And it, it will always be that. So, and you're talking about not only making a rapid decision with enough, enough idea of what you're wanting to do, but there's also this concept of grit. And I think, how, how does that play into, because you did write a book and it has to do, I think the word firing is in it. And you, you wrote a book about, it's called Fire Someone Today. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about like, what is that book? What is that book about? What does that mean for, for people that haven't read it? Um, and why is it so important for, for that concept of, uh, is it hiring slow, firing fast? What, what is that? What is the concept? Well, Fire Someone Today is actually 21 different kind of business lessons and firing people is one of them because uh and at the heart of that particular lesson is this idea that you need the that everybody has a right place like i think there's a job for everyone where they can be successful be encouraged get a raise be promoted do great work but obviously everyone's not right for every job and sometimes we we get focused on the fact that people need a job and we're afraid to take that job away from them and what we do instead is we do them a disservice instead of you know in this paternalistic, I'm going to take care of you mentality, we keep people in jobs they don't belong in. But when you keep someone in a job they don't belong in, you certainly don't give them a raise. You certainly don't give them encouragement about what a great job they're doing. You don't praise them. You, you actually just start to resent them. So now this person is being held in a job where I can't seem to get promoted. I can't seem to get a raise. The boss is always grumpy when he looks at me. Like, you're not doing that person a favor. You're hurting them. You're wasting their time right? Set them free to go find a job where they're going to be successful and going to be encouraged and going to get promoted and going to get a raise. And it's radical candor, right? It's that whole concept of like, absolutely. Like I care about you. Therefore I'm going to point you in the right direction of a place you should be. And you could get coaching for the thing you're good at versus me trying to coach you on something that you're not necessarily cut out for. Right. And that gets even to our corporate values, right? Sometimes we have to be honest that you're not cut out for this job right? Or you're not going to be successful in this place. And it's going to hurt in the short term because sure, nobody wants to go home today fired and unemployed. But yeah. it, the right thing for you might be to get out of this position and into one where you're going to be really successful. So you, you clearly have a vision and you've, you've stayed really, really tight to this core values and you've, you've brought the right people in your world. And I don't want to talk too much about COVID because we all know it's here. You have, you have, uh, the work from home element is great. I'm sure it's been very helpful. You, what is the vision going for? We, we're in a really uh, strange world today. Very strange. What, you know, with the uncertainty of the climate that we're in right now, whether it's environmental, political, whatever it may be, 
what's your vision going forward? How, how important is pivoting in this, like being light on your toes in this, in this world today as a business owner? I think there's two things that I'm, I'm clinging to in this period. One is the ability to make rapid decisions or to change your mind quickly, right? We just, you have to be adaptable. We don't know when things are going to open up or when it's going to get worse or when it's going to get better or when the skies are going to get full of wildfire smoke or whatever it is, right? right? So just being flexible and expecting that. The other thing is first principles. I'm a huge fan of, of going back to first principles. And I think we sometimes lose sight of that, right? Well, the whole world's different today. Say, well, that, that might be true in many ways, but there are still first principles that don't go away, right? People like to be with people, right? <laughs> so while we're all working from home, we have 5,000 years of recorded human history that tells us that people like to get together with the other people they do things with. Mm -hmm. And no matter how good Zoom video conferencing is, I don't think it's going to fix this first principle of I like to be with people because right. that's how people are, right? And the modes of that can change and different things can change, right? I mean, if you were in the, the you know, apparel industry, there was a day when every man wore a hat and then there was a day after John F. Kennedy's election where every man didn't wear a hat and things changed, but people still wear clothing, right? And, yep. and the first principles are- Most do, don't, most do. Yeah. Most of them do, yes. And I think that, that we can cling to those core first principles and getting, you know, reminding ourselves of them, right? So I think on the other side of this, that offices are not dead because I think that people want to get in a room with a whiteboard and talk to each other. And it might be different. And maybe some people work from home one or two days a week and come into the office other days. And maybe companies reorganize their schedules so all the meetings happen on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but not on Monday, Friday. I don't know how all those details work out, but I'm pretty sure the office isn't dead because they effectively had offices in ancient Egypt and they had offices, you know, places where people got together to talk in ancient Greece. And, you know, I just don't see how that fundamental of the human nature is going to change. Right. And you just could take that to everything that, that comes in the scary horizons. So what's been your constant? I mean, through all of this, I mean, you, you, you run a company, obviously you've got a, like an executive team that helps support you. You've got friends, family, mentors, colleagues, whatever it may be. What's been your constant? What's the thing that in, in this time uh, or in any time that you go back to um, that regrounds you, recenters you, gets you ready for the day and to sometimes go to battle? I mean, sometimes you're, you're going to battle. So what, what is that for you? I mean, for me, at some level, that's just kind of the, the confidence I have in my faith and, in the, you know, the, the big story of how I see the, the drama of the world playing out. Uh, and it, it's about, again, it gets back to those, those first principles, right? Am I never going to be able to have dinner with somebody again? No, that, that, that isn't plausible. <laughs> One way or another, we'll figure that out, right? And again, uh, also history, right? You know, as terrible as this pandemic has been, is it as bad as living through the Black Plague in medieval Europe? Nope. I read those books about that, and it was worse, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it's one thing to compare the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, but, you know, there, there's been a lot worse plagues in human history than we're suffering now, right? So I just, again, going back to history, going back to those those first principles is very reassuring. So as, I've been as frustrated as anybody else through this period, and, you know, sometimes maybe even more because I got all these business things going that get, you know, get s stuck by COVID-related problems. But in the big picture, we're, we're not living in the worst of times. We're we actually have a lot of blessings and a lot of advantages they didn't have when they were struggling with the Black Plague. I'm glad we're not living through the Black Plague. I'm, yes. I'm a very, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, <laughs> we all <laughs> I, are. I value my limbs and my my breathing and all the things. Uh, Bob, uh, to to kind of wrap this all up, tell me or tell the world, tell Bellingham, our local community, what's what's most important. Like, what's the message that you'd like to? to give to people that live in Bellingham, to other business owners that, you know, maybe it's a, a mix of uh, entrepreneurial advice or it's business advice, or it's just life. Like tell, from your experience, what would you like to pass along as a final like gift to uh, our listeners? Um, boy, that just seems like such an opportunity. I don't want to blow this here. Uh, <laughs> don't blow it, Bob. Don't blow it. <laughs> I, you know, the, the work we're doing every day is, is where we're spending our lives, where we're investing our time and our energy, right? And I, I'm, I think that uh, in giving people the, the, encouraging everyone to, to appreciate the other people who are making that contribution, right? Sometimes I think in Bellingham, there's a tendency to like, we have a beautiful thing, it's a great place to live, and we want to like, 
you know, we want to lock the doors and not tell anybody or not let anyone else move here or, you know, get in the way of something getting built because we don't like the change. But those, those changes aren't, aren't, they're all people, right? All these things are people, all the businesses are people, right? You know, the developer who wants to build an apartment building, it's so people have a place to live and be sheltered out of the rain, right? It gets back to first principles, right? It's not about, you know, being greedy. It's about putting shelter out there. And sure, somebody's gonna make money because we all make money by doing our business and engaging that. And I think that that's one of the things about Bellingham that we can sometimes get lose sight of is that, you know, we're, we're all our friends and neighbors and coworkers and, you know, building Bellingham, I like the name of your, your, uh, your series here, right? It's like, we're building Bellingham, not for some kind of nefarious goal, but because it's where we live and where people need to live and where people want to, to live and grow. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. I think that it's, uh, we get so caught up in just the, the literal building Bellingham, but it's also about community. It's also about friendship. It's also about um, supporting and collaborating. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that message. And sorry, sorry if I put you on the spot there on that. That's a tough question. It's very open-ended, but I, I do really appreciate your, your response to that. And uh, Bob, thank you so much for joining us. This is episode one of season two, and we kicked it off with a bang here. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I know you have a lot going on uh, to join me and uh, just share your story and your knowledge. And uh, so thank you uh, for joining us today. Thanks, Leo. It's been great. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failures, and business with entrepreneurs right here in Bellingham, Washington. You can watch interviews live and be the first to hear about upcoming guests on the Building Bellingham Facebook and Instagram pages. Again, I'm your host, Leo Cohen of the Cohen Group Northwest. This episode was produced and edited by Cooper Hansley and Tiffany Holden. Our logo was designed by Sam Vogt. To learn more about the team behind the podcast, search Cohen Group NW on Google, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn.